I'd like to start firstly by thanking you, James, for your support during my fellowship and for inviting me to present this lecture tonight. I'm very humbled by your invitation to follow in the footsteps of many of my UNSW colleagues and international visitors who've also presented lectures, including my dear friend Deborah Brennan, who I think inaugurated this series a number of years ago. And thank you, Andy, for your very kind words. One of the wonderful things about an academic life is meeting colleagues who inspire your work and with whom you can develop research synergies. And so it's been the case with you, Andy. Anyone who knows Andy won't be surprised to know that she challenges me often, uh, but always in productive and very positive ways. You're a model of intellectual integrity and rigour and an inspiring teacher. You've ingrained in me a deep understanding of the importance of law as a tool of social change and you've been a great friend and made my life here at UNSW a very happy one, so many thanks. Events such as these always take a lot of work and tonight I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of Will Balfour and his team and to thank Emily Waller and Rose Gray, my incredibly dedicated research assistants who make my research life possible. And I'd also like to acknowledge here, while I have the opportunity, the support of my husband Robert, my wonderful family and friends and colleagues, many of whom are here tonight. So, in February 2011, I was fortunate to spend a month in Florence with my family while on a fellowship at the European University Institute. And yes, I'll admit that international adventures are also unquestionably another great thing about the academic life. Being out of season, we had the privilege of exploring Florence's magnificent museums at our leisure. And one afternoon, wandering through the Pitti Palace with my mother-in-law, Betty, who's here tonight, we were stopped dead in our tracks, arrested by Rubens' masterpiece, The Consequences of War. A large work it dominated the wall on which it hung, not only because of its dimensions and its exquisite execution, but also because of its subject matter. Immersed in my project on gender justice at the International Criminal Court, the painting held very strong resonances for me. And tonight I want to start by exploring a few of these because I think they go to the heart of the so what questions that frame this lecture. So the consequences of war was painted in 1638 and captures the turmoil of the 30 years war that was engulfing Europe at this time. Importantly, the war ended in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia, a series of treaties that established the foundations of the contemporary international relations system based on the notion of state sovereignty. The allegorical painting commissioned by the Medici family projects a strong anti-war message reflecting the devastating consequences of conflict. In this masterpiece, the central illuminated figure, Venus, the Roman goddess of love, appears as a plaintive victim. Despite her entreaties, her lover Mars, the god of war, seems determined to carry on the battle, spurred on by the wicked Electo, the goddess of fury. The darkly draped female figure of Europa looks on desperately while her, sis her sister, representing arts and culture, is trampled. The cowering woman clinging to her child points to the particular vulnerability of mothers and children in warfare. The nakedness of almost all the female figures is a reminder to the viewer of the violations of women's bodies in war. In illustrating the terror and destruction that comes with conflict, the painting reminds us that war has always been understood in gendered terms, presented primarily by the male warrior and the female victim. Though here, with the presence of Electo, Rubens also raises the spectre of another female architect, the fury archetype, sorry, the furious monster. These gender dimensions of conflict, conveyed with such powerful imagery in Rubens' painting, have not only been reflected in art, but also in conflict-related politics and diplomacy, and in the laws of war. As in this masterpiece, international humanitarian and criminal law, including under the Geneva Conventions, has tended to portray men as the architects and the combatants of battle, the active legal subjects of armed conflict. By contrast, women have been tre treated primarily as vulnerable victims and as mothers, but, but rarely as independent public actors. In distinction to Rubens' masterpiece, 
Women's roles as belligerents and perpetrators of violence have largely been ignored under the law. The foundations of contemporary international law developed at the same time as Rubin's painting were strongly influenced by Dutch diplomat and jurist Hugo Grotius. According to international legal scholar Diane Amman, Grotius's worldview, quote, depicts women and children as bystanders, beings not fully conscious of the world around them, not actors, but rather objects in the tableau of the battlefield. Importantly, from my research perspective, the law has been especially blind to the systematic and widespread use of sexual and gender-based violence, experienced by men and boys, but especially women and girls. For millennia, conflict-related sexual violence has largely been seen as an unfortunate but incidental consequence of war. Where such violence has been recognised as a crime, it's been considered in Grotius's terms a violation of chastity. Rape and other forms of sexual violence have been considered a crime against the honour of a woman and of her male protectors, but not a grievous violation equivalent to other war crimes. Rarely identified, investigated or prosecuted, the victims of conflict-related sexual violence have survived largely without the protection of the law, left to carry the shame and stigma of their traumatic experiences. In those extraordinary instances where the perpetrators of these crimes have been put on trial, their victims have often suffered a re-traumatisation in the courtroom. These victims have faced humili humiliating questioning, aspersions about their character and disbelief in their testimony. Prosecutors relying on methods that are often inappropriate for the investigation of sexual violence crimes have assumed that these crimes are necessarily harder to investigate and prove in a court of law. A view judges have helped to encourage and reinforce. These are some of what I call the gendered legacies of international criminal law. The so what questions that I want to pose tonight are how far has international law moved on from the gendered images depicted in Rubin's painting and historically codified in international criminal law? To what extent do the gender justice rules underpinning the new International Criminal Court reflect a turning point in the recognition of women and victims of sexual and gender-based violence? Where and why have some of these new provisions been resisted? And what are the consequences of the gender justice outcomes of the new court for, the, for its legitimacy? I'm interested in exploring these questions out of a general interest in securing institutional gender justice, and more specifically from a concern about the ongoing legitimacy of the ICC. As many of you are no doubt aware, the court is a very fragile entity. It must walk a fine line between the realpolitik of international relations and a commitment to the unbiased application of the rule of law all the while attempting to realise its high aspirations to end impunity for the worst atrocities. The ICC has multiple constituencies watching and assessing its every move. States, the UN system, regional bodies such as the African Union, defence and victims' rights advocates and a strong civil society movement. Each constituency demands different things of the court and measures success according to their singular interests. <coughs> Some of these interests and the ICC's frailty have been on display in The Hague this, this week, with the court's first attempt to bring current sitting head of state, the President of Kenya, to trial. The case raises the prospect of the Kenyan government and the wider African Union withdrawing their support for the court. The Kenyan situation and seeming inconsistencies in the UN Security Council's referral to the court agreeing that Sudan and Libya should come under ICC scrutiny, but not the situation in Gaza, Iraq or Syria, let alone the UK or America, leave many questioning the ICC's impartiality and value. Each of these issues sets up different legitimacy challenges for the court. My focus here tonight is on another specific legitimacy challenge confronting the ICC. It relates to its promise to address impunity for sexual and gender-based violence. As I'll outline, gender justice advocates made a significant impression on the design of the court. In commencing operations, state parties and ICC personnel made promises that the court would bring about greater accountability for these crimes. The space between this promise and its reality is the point at which the gender justice legitimacy gap of the court emerges. Arguably, the wider this gap, the more fragile the court. 
I'll come back to this legitimacy question later, but first I want to outline the features of the ICC's gender justice framework and consider how well its aspirations have been met in the first dozen years of the ICC's work. The International Criminal Court became operational in 2002 after the requisite 60 states ratified the court's Rome Statute. There are currently 122 state parties to the statute, but importantly, not three of the five permanent UN Security Council members, the US, China and Russia, and nor are other important states members, including India and Israel. The court currently has 20 cases before it, all of these stemming from African conflicts, although it is investigating uh, crimes in other regions. In its first decade, the court has handed down two guilty verdicts and one acquittal, each relating to the Democratic Republic of Congo. The founders of the ICC created an innovative tribunal. It's a permanent body with the capacity to prosecute individuals at all levels, including heads, sitting heads of state. It has jurisdiction over the worst atrocities, crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide, and in the future also the crime of aggression. It establishes the principle of complementarity, which recognises national prosecution of international crimes, takes precedent over international prosecution, making the ICC a court of last resort. A state can only become subject to ICC intervention if they do not take action to address violations of international law or where their action demonstrates an inability or unwillingness to investigate these atrocities genuine, genuinely. This means that the ICC teeters between the values of sovereignty developed in the time of Rubens and Grotius and the 20th century concept of internationalism. Uniquely for an international criminal tribunal, it gives victims rights at all stages of proceedings and includes a reparations framework arising from convictions. One of the most notable aspects of the Rome Statute is its inclusion of an expansive gender justice mandate. The international political context of the 1990s, when the ICC was being designed, was conducive to its development. This was a period of international women's rights activism, reaching a high point with the 1995 Beijing Women's Conference. This event focused attention on the need to reinforce women's equality through political, legal and economic institutions. The period was also marked by significant advancements in international criminal law, with the establishment in the early 1990s of the two UN ad hoc criminal tribunals to address the conflicts in Rwanda and in the former Yugoslavia. These tribunals had limited mandates in relation to sexual and gender-based violence, and the legacies of the law were clearly on display at these tribunals. Female witnesses were subjected to harsh and insensitive cross-examinations. Prosecutors were remiss in including charges of rape, despite extensive evidence of such crimes. And sexual violence charges failed to stand up in court due to the poor quality of the evidence. But gender justice actors also secured some important advances through these tribunals, including greater prosecutorial and judicial recognition of rape as a war crime and also a crime against humanity, a form of genocide and a form of torture. At a more general level, the testimony arising from the tribunals meant the international community could no longer plead ignorance about the nature and scale of these crimes. Increasingly, conflict-related sexual violence Became, came to be recognised for what it is. Not an unfortunate consequence, but a systematic, cheap and effective weapon of war. Arising from this context was a cluster of committed, highly skilled feminist legal advocates who drew lessons from the tribunals and targeted the emerging International Criminal Court as a new venue through which to expand gender justice. Coming together to form the Women's Caucus for Gender Justice, they set out uh, to lobby state delegates charged with drawing up the ICC's blueprint. During the design phase, caucus members situated themselves as what I would call critical feminist friends. They were aware that shifting the gender, gender legacies of the law was a long-term and iterative project which would require compromises. As one of the members of the caucus explains, we came to the conclusion that the train is leaving the station and if we don't jump on right now, what's going to be the outcome? We won't be able to change it afterwards, so let's try and do it now. We do this understanding it's a position that has in inherent flaws." Unquote. Negotiations over the court's design took three years and involved 148 states. 
Although states were ultimately responsible for determining the ICC's formal rules, global civil society, including the Women's Caucus, had an unprecedented role in influencing states throughout the design process. The Women's Caucus entered negotiations with a set of clearly defined objectives. These map very neatly onto social theorist Nancy Fraser's three-pronged model of gender justice, including the need for gender recognition, representation and redistribution. The caucus successfully lobbied to have core provisions codified in the Rome Statute, including the recognition of the widest ever range of conflict-related sexual violence and gender-based crimes ever articulated under international law, and the acknowledgement of the gravity of these crimes. The recognition of gender as a grounds for persecution was included for the first time, and a stipulation that the law must be applied without gender-based or other forms of discrimination. The caucus also convinced states to include a provision for fair representation of women judges as well as gender experts across all aspects of the court's work. These advocates were also a key influence on the inclusion of a victim's redress mandate, including its reparations provisions, which possibly can provide some redistribution. These important gains did not come easily. The Women's Caucus confronted strong resistance to many of its priorities, especially from certain Catholic and Islamic-led states who, with the backing of the Holy See, worked very hard to counter gender justice claims and with some success. For instance, these states and the Holy See were opposed to any language that might provide the court with the power to recognise persecution on the grounds of homosexuality. And due to their influence, the definition of gender that came to be encoded in the statute was much narrow, narrower than originally proposed. The same states also strenuously opposed the inclusion of the crime of enforced pregnancy, a crime that was widely used in the Yugoslav conflict. It was opposed on the grounds that it could interfere with states' anti-abortion laws. Although other states and the Women's Caucus identified this as a spurious claim, the involvement of these conservative forces resulted in the contraction of that provision and the inclusion of a caveat protecting national pregnancy laws. The Women's Caucus also faced resistance in their efforts to engender the principle of complementarity. The Caucus sought the inclusion of a provision giving the ICC power to judge a state unable or unwilling to maintain jurisdiction of a case if that state's laws did not match the gender justice standards of the Rome Statute. States' resistance to this proposal was almost unanimous. They refused to allow the ICC the power to closely scrutinise their penal codes for gender injustices, seeing such efforts as an incursion on their sovereignty. As a result, at the critical point at which state sovereignty meets the ICC, there is no specific direction relating to gender justice. Not surprisingly, these very mixed outcomes met with mixed responses from the gender justice community. Some individuals celebrated the Rome Statute as a watershed moment in international criminal law. Others were more circumspect, expressing ambivalence about the outcome. Leading caucus member Barbara Bedont captured these mixed feelings very well when she said, at two o'clock in the morning of July the 18th, 1998, in a bar by the Colosseum, a group of delegates celebrated the adoption of the statute. I sat amongst them not knowing how to react to their jubilation. While I was relieved that the statute had been adopted, I couldn't help but mourn the loss of many provisions which would have made the court stronger. Finally, when some of the delegates started to sing, we are the champions, I knew the time had come for me to go. Despite these reservations, many gender justice actors expressed a willingness to work with the court to realise its promise. Taking the lead on pushing for the implementation of the Rome Statute has been the successor organisation to the Women's Caucus known as the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice. New Zealander Bridget Inder, a former New South Wales Legal Aid Officer and friend to a number of us here at UNSW, has led the organisation since its inception. And as I'll discuss, Women's Initiatives has played a pivotal role in securing gender justice outcomes at the court and has been the key proponent holding the court accountable for its gender justice promise, including through its annual gender report cards. In this next section, I want to use Fraser's three categories of gender justice to assess how well the court has met its outcomes in its um, first 12 years. So first to the good news. There has been a growing recognition of gender justice in the work of the court, evident in a range of ways. 
Sexual violence crimes against women and girls are increasingly being investigated and included in charges uh, by the Office of the Prosecutor. And currently 80% of the current cases include such charges. There's also been some evidence in the prosecutor's charging strategy of a growing understanding of how sexual violence is experienced by victims. To date, sexual violence has been charged as rape and also serious bodily and mental harm, sexual slavery, torture, persecution and outrages on personal dignity. Reflecting the lived experiences in conflict situations, the ICC is also investigating its first possible case of sexual violence crimes committed by a female perpetrator. The court has also established procedural rules which recognise specific harms suffered by victims of sexual and gender-based violence. This has included improved courtroom protections, the appointment of skilled legal representatives and the provision of psychosocial support services for victims during courtroom appearances. As my UNSW colleague Ludmilla Stern has shown, the ICC's Translation and Interpretation Division has also paid careful attention to the needs of victims and witnesses, including those of sexual violence, when giving their testimony. One of the most unambiguous and standout developments of the ICC relates to the representation element of gender justice. Currently, 60% of ICC judges are female. And as this pink line on this uh, graph shows, that figure has increased at almost every judicial election since 2002. The number of women judges at the ICC surpasses the record of women's representation in any court, uh, based on all the evidence I can find, as well as at any other international criminal tribunal. The outstanding results of the representation of women on the ICC bench has triggered a remarkable event. In December this year, the ICC's Assembly of States Party is poised to elect six new judges. The Assembly is in the unique position of being required to vote for a minimum of one male candidate to ensure that there is not an over-representation of women on the bench under the Rome Statute standard of fair representation of men and women in the judiciary. This really is a stunning development, one that would have seemed unimaginable to the court's gender justice architects just 12 years ago. Following the argument of feminist political theorist Anne Phillips, it's my view that the level of female judicial representation is an important development for its own sake. Whatever the political, and by this I mean gender justice, orientation of these female judges, their presence sends a critical message to the world that women are equal international citizens and have both the right and the capacity to adjudicate on matters of global significance. But importantly, as the literature on gender in legislatures tells us, it's not just the number of women that matters to gender equality outcomes, but whether both women and men with institutional, within institutional settings are committed to these goals. And it's important in this context to note that the ICC includes rules to have judges with sexual and gender-based violence expertise. Based on available biographies, it transpires that the majority of judges on the court claim to have such expertise developed in their formative years as lawyers, judges or academics. And given the predominance of judges with these backgrounds, it suggests there is a greater likelihood, but of course no guarantee, that the statute's sexual and gender crimes will be understood and interpreted in ways which potentially advance gender justice. Evidence of the impact of such expertise came in the ICC's first trial against DRC militia leader Thomas Lubanga. This case was largely one of misrecognition. In a shock to the ICC's gender justice constituency, the prosecutor refused to bring charges of sexual violence against the accused, despite extensive evidence of the use of these crimes in the conflict in which Lubanga was involved. Instead, he was charged and ultimately found guilty of the crimes of enlisting, conscripting and using child soldiers. However, during this three-year trial, one of the three judges on the bench, Elizabeth Odio Benito, consistently and persistently asked important gender questions. Benito had also been a judge on the Yugoslav Tribunal, where she developed quite a reputation for adopting a gender-sensitive approach. In the Lubanga case, through her questions, Judge Benito drew out testimony from victims about the different experiences of boy and girl soldiers, including the perpetration of sexual violence against them. And when it came to the verdict and sentencing stage, the majority judges refused to acknowledge that sex and gender evidence, blaming the prosecutor for a lack of charges. 
Benito respectfully, strongly disagreed with her colleagues. Handing down dissenting decisions on the verdict and sentencing, Judge Benito argued that sexual violence was indeed intrinsic to the experiences of child soldiers and that such acts should be taken into account in sentencing Lubanga. Judge Benito's minority decisions created a backlash. In one commentator's view, her, ru her ruling, quote, appears rather as a policy speech for certain constituencies in the NGO community than a strict judicial analysis. Another argued that Benito's dissenting opinions reflected, quote, the latest trend of international decisions, which is to have a strong dissent from a Latin American judge trying to push a human rights agenda. These sta statements highlight the ongoing legitimacy challenge faces, faced by judges seeking to apply the gender justice rules provided under the Rome Statute. But a more positive reading sees that Judge Benito's dissensions show the importance of having a judge on the bench able to bring to light gendered experiences of conflict, even if these views do not immediately impact the outcomes of the trial. Encouragingly, although Benito's dissensions made no difference to Lubanga's verdict and sentence, some aspects of her decisions have already been applied in other ICC cases, perhaps reflecting a growing gender sensitivity at the court. Significant too in terms of representation is the election in 2012 of Fatou Ben Souda as the ICC's second prosecutor. And as you might be able to see in this slide, Prosecutor Ben Souda has pledged to make gender crimes a priority of her nine year term. As a sign of her commitment to this area, she invited Bridget Inder from Women's Initiatives to be her special gender advisor and together they've designed the prosecution's first detailed gender policy which was released in July this year. Another important advance in relation to representation has come about through the use by gender civil society advocates of the ICC's amicus curiae or expert submission provisions. Women's initiatives have been granted leave on several occasions to provide submissions that give the court contextual information about the extent, use and nature of sexual violence in conflict settings. And often these submissions have been reflected in the judge's deliberations. It can also be argued that the redistributive element of gender justice has been advanced through the ICC. The court's trust fund for victims has responsibility for administering reparations orders of the court as well as its own assistance programs. The trust fund has developed dedicated programs to address the needs of women and girls, including education of former girl soldiers, support for women and girls who have borne children as a result of conflict-related rape, and special women's healthcare facilities. Also importantly, in the ICC's first and so far only reparations decision in the Lubanga case, the trial chamber agreed to principles that include victims of sexual and gender-based violence. In direct contrast to the majority's verdict and sentencing in this case, and reflecting the submission of the women's initiatives, the judges unanimously argued for the development of transformative gender reparations principles including measures capable of dismantling gender hierarchies in the DRC. These positive developments meet, or in the case of the judiciary, exceed the expectations of gender justice architects of the ICC. However, as anyone interested in gender equality would expect, they're only part of the story. Those responsible for implementing and interpreting the court's gender justice mandate have helped reinforce gender legacies through gaps silences and obvious points of inaction. The most challenging area of ICC gender justice practice has been in ensuring sexual and gender-based crimes are properly investigated, charged and successfully prosecuted. And my PhD student Rose Gray is finishing a very important dissertation on this topic in which she shows that although the ICC prosecutor is increasingly charging sexual and gender-based violations, there is a significant fall off of these charges during the court proceedings. A decline in charges should be expected in any criminal trial as the standard of proof increases at each stage. However, as Rose's data in this table shows with sexual uh, crimes marked in pink, the drop-off is much steeper than for others. We are left with the stark result that in the court's first 12 years, the ICC has failed to secure a single conviction for sexual or gender-based violence. As one scholar has recently noted, there must be more going on here than just problems with technicalities of the law. I think two fa factors help it 
account for this poor record, both of which are tied to the gender legacies of the law. First, the ongoing weaknesses in investigation and evidence gathering undertaken by the Office of the Prosecutor. In their decisions, judges have been scathing in their criticism of the Office, and especially the first prosecutor, um, Marino Ocampo, for evidence being insufficient, poorly pleaded and incapable of su supporting the charges sought. Women's initiatives and other civil society actors have made specific criticisms about the weaknesses in the prosecution's efforts to gather the appropriate evidence, uh, standard of evidence to convict alleged perpetrators of sexual and gender-based violence. In May this year, the court handed down its second guilty verdict in relation to another DRC militia leader, Jermaine Katanga. In this case, the accused was convicted on all but the sexual violence charges. From the start of Katanga's trial, the women's initiatives continually raised this concern with the prosecutor about its potentially weak evidence and the need to gather further witnesses' accounts. They argue that the prosecutor should have been aware of the need to make a special effort in this regard, given in the women's caucus, uh, initiatives view the, quote, additional judicial scrutiny uniquely but predictably applied to acts of sexual violence. Judge Christine Vanden Vingart pulled no punches in her decision in Katanga, excoriating the prosecution for its extremely weak evidence base, its lack of due diligence and credibility problems throughout the case, including in relation to sexual violence. But all the blame for the ICC's lack of conviction in its first 12 years cannot be laid at the door of the prosecutor. The judges too have contributed to this poor outcome. In a number of cases where the prosecution has advanced strong evidence, Judges have adopted a narrow reading of the law, sometimes narrower than the at UN ad hoc tribunals. For instance, the ICC judges refused to accept, in line with rulings from the Rwandan tribunal, that forcing women to undress in public in order to humiliate them met the gravity threshold for a crime against humanity. In another case, the chamber dismissed the prosecutor's attempt to link charges of rape to charges of torture to allow the court to recognise not only the harm to the rape victims themselves, but also the harm suffered by their family members who were forced to watch the violation. Such cumulative effects were recognised at both the Yugoslav and Rwandan tribunals. In one of its most bizarre rulings of all, in a Kenyan case, judges refused to accept that forced circumcision and penile amputations were sexual crimes, reflecting a very limited understanding of the gendered nature of the law and the varied experiences of sexual violence. Another problem at the court is that the Office of the Prosecutor appears to have paid very little attention in its complementarity investigations to establish what action, if any, a state has undertaken to address reported crimes of sexual and gender-based violence through domestic prosecutions. Gender justice act actors concerned during the court's design phase is being brought out, borne out in practice. That is, the lack of overt provisions in the Rome Statute to direct the court to scrutinise domestic sexual violence prosecutions means impunity for these cri crimes continues. The ICC also confronts a gender representation discrepancy across its victims' redress mandate. Substantially fewer women are involved in the ICC's outreach programs or come forward to register as victims with the court. In the most stark situation in Darfur, there are 70% fewer women registering as victims. This gender disparity, disparity has a knock-on effect. It leads to problem of recognition without women's voices in the courtroom. International criminal law is left with only a very partial understanding of women's experiences of war and conflict. It also potentially sets up problems for the court's redistributive functions. It could be the case in future that those not registered as victims in a particular case will have less, less access to any reparations awarded by the court. So what do these partial and tenuous outcomes suggest about recognition and resistance to gender justice at the ICC and its ongoing legitimacy? Well, first, I think it's clear that there has been a degree of gender justice recognition. Together, internal and external advocates have worked to ensure that some of the ICC's new rules are being used some of the time to advance gender justice claims. The significant number of women on the bench, the appointment of gender experts, the increasing number of charges for sexual and gender-based violence, and the first reparations decision signal greater recognition, representation and a measure of redistribution.
Judge Benito's probing and dissenting opinions in Lubanga show that even where a case produces negative outcomes in terms of the verdict and sentencing, interventions by key actors within the court can ultimately lead to a deeper understanding of the gender dimensions of crimes. But we've also seen concerning trends, including signs of resistance to applying the progressive gender justice rules in the statute. This resistance has been evident in the court's first decade in poorly investigated and prosecuted sexual crimes, retrograde judicial decisions and problems of victims' access. Signs of this resistance have been relatively subtle. There's no evidence to suggest that ICC personnel are overtly rejecting the formal gender rules. But I'd not suggest that it's a problem of unconscious bias either. After three decades of high profile gender justice advocacy and the codification of detailed, a detailed gender mandate in the Rome Statute, it's hard to believe that anyone operating in the world of international criminal law could remain unconscious of the significance and need for remedy of these gender justice concerns. Rather, I think the problem is partly one of indifference and deprioritisation, especially on the part of the initial prosecutor, and partly a case of timidity on the part of the ICC ju ICC's judges. It's been well recognised that international criminal law in general has developed through a process of judicial creativity, in contrast, I think, to that pejorative term, judicial activism. The problem at the ICC is that judges have largely been unwilling to act creatively when it comes to the court's gender justice rules. ICCs have the scope under the Rome Statute to interpret the rules in ways, ways that could transform the experiences of women and of sexual and gender-based violence victims under international law. In the court's first 12 years, it appears very few have the appetite to do so. This is probably not unrelated to the fact that when judges do attempt to use these rules, as Judge Benito did, they quickly become targets for attack demonstrating the ongoing influence of gender legacies of the law. What I think we're seeing here at the ICC is a process of displacement, what my Edinburgh, and Edinburgh friend and colleague Fiona Mackay would call one of remembering the old and forgetting the new. In the first decade, we've seen examples of the Office of the Prosecutor, judges and other actors at the court allowing the legacies of the law to slip back in, to infiltrate, if you like, its operations with little, if any, resistance. This highlights the tenacity of the gender legacies of the law. A reason for their persistence, I'd suggest, comes from the fact that they are instantiated not primarily through positive action, but through episodes of inaction. It is where ICC personnel have not pursued investigations or laid charges, where they have not gathered essential evidence, and they, where they have not remembered earlier legal judgments, which advanced a more sophisticated understanding of the gravity and harm of specific gendered criminal acts. As Hilary Charlesworth pointed out a number of years ago, it's the silences of the law that can be the most powerful, the most difficult to identify and the most difficult to address. Because of the permeation of gender legacies of the law in ICC practice, we're witnessing the emergence of a gender justice legitimacy gap the gap that spans the growing distance between the ICC's aspirational commitments and its practice. This is a worrying development as it could lead to the disengagement and eventual withdrawal of support by gender justice act actors at the court. Given the place of these actors as one of the ICC's core constituencies, this would be a significant blow to an already fragile institution. But it is important to remember that for legitimacy to be maintained, it's not necessary that all constituents' demands be met all of the time. As international relations theorists Cohen and Buchanan remind us, institutions can still be, quote, be worthy of our support, even if they do not maximally serve our interests and even if they do not measure up to our highest moral standards. Rather, as they suggest, legitimacy depends on institutional actors being committed to maintaining accountability and transparency in relation to their interested publics and willing to undertake ongoing critical review and revision of their institutional goals and actions. What I'm saying here is that for the ICC to maintain the support of its gender justice constituency, it does not only need to focus on their demands or seek to perfectly implement the court's gender justice mandate. 
Rather, the ICC must work to engage this constituency, be willing to justify its decisions and policies to it, and display an ongoing commitment to learning from and acting on its obvious failures and shortcomings. And encouragingly, it does appear that the court is putting some effort into maintaining the confidence of its gender justice constituency, despite its dismal prosecution record and other initial missteps. The prosecutor's recent gender policy is probably the best example here. It demonstrates a willingness of the prosecutor to critically reflect on the court's practice in its first decade, identify its shortcomings and commit to revising strategic operational policy into the future. The ICC has also undertaken other reviews, including in relation to victims, which identified the need for further adjustment to court practices to better enable participation and protection for those most vulnerable, singling out victims of sexual and gender-based violence. As we know, the proof of these measures will be in their implementation. Nevertheless, I think that even in their adoption, these reform efforts send an important signal that ICC personnel are not blind to the gender justice legitimacy gap that is emerging and are seeking to respond appropriately. These measures may well help reset the gender justice path at the ICC. Finally, I also want to suggest that strengthening the leg legitimacy of the ICC requires a two-way effort not only from the court to its constituency base, but vice versa. I think that it's important for the long-term viability of the ICC that its external gender justice community responds in two ways. First, it's important that it reassesses and perhaps dampens its expectations about what the court can deliver. As I think that over the years there's been a degree of mission creep and unrealistic and expanded expectations of the court's role not only by the gender justice community, but their broader ICC civil society community as well. Like all international organisations, the ICC's aspirations are not matched by its capacity, a fact made amply um, apparent in the court's first decade. But this is not to let the ICC off the hook for its gender justice mandate, but to ask its constituency to follow the ICC's lead, to take stock, re-evaluate the ICC's capabilities in light of its early developments and resources and realign its objectives within these limitations. Second, I want to suggest that the ICC's gender justice constituency and the broader women's movement becomes more focused on how to catalyse the ICC's mandate, especially through its complementarity provisions to strengthen gender justice at the national level. This could include gender justice groups operating within states and through national human rights institutions to support investigation and evidence gathering processes. Most productively, these organisations could work to encourage states to ratify the Rome Statute and then importantly implement its advanced gender justice rules into the local penal code, helping to strengthen state level accountability mechanisms. Bringing domestic laws up to a standard equivalent to the Rome Statute is certain to be a more fruitful avenue for addressing impunity for conflict-related sexual violence crimes than a handful of high-profile pro prosecutions in The Hague. The gendered consequences of war captured in Rubin's masterpiece continue to resonate in the practice of the International Criminal Court. The effort to redraw the boundaries of the law to better recognise men and women's experiences of conflict has been a contested and iterative process. The scorecard of the ICC's first dozen years suggests there are still pockets of resistance and a long way to go to achieve complete gender equality under the law. Potentially transformative rules are in place and women have secured a position on the bench. What is required now are sensitive investigations convincing evidence, targeted charges and bold judging. The closer the alignment between the ICC's rules and practices, the stronger will be its foundation and the more robust its legitimacy. If past, practice errors, past practices are a window into the future, this alignment will not come easily. It's likely to arrive in small, contentious steps, but the effort will be worth it if it results in a more complete understanding of and accountability for the consequences of war for men and boys and women and girls. Thank you.